hello everyone. Today, uh, welcome to the fourth in the series of the webinar seminars um, NIFOS is organizing with CyberSite. Today, we're going to be talking about a different topic. I would like to wish Nigeria, where I come from, a happy Independence Day. Um, NIFOS is a, uh, a society of all pediatric ophthalmologists in Nigeria who have committed to ensuring the overall eye health of the Nigerian child. So we are about 37 in number, and we're all in Africa, which happens to be the world's second largest and the second most populous continent after Asia. We have a population of 186 million, and 90 million of this number are under 18 years. So you can see they are largely a pediatric population. We have about 37 pediatric ophthalmologists, which is still less than 10% of the 500 um, ophthalmologists that are um, in the country. So today, we're going to be discussing abnormal head posture, a new look at an old topic. So I'm introducing to you Dr. Lionel Kowal to do what he knows best, talking about pediatric ophthalmology strapisness. You're welcome, sir. It's a privilege to have you with us in Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Adia, thank you very much. Well, good morning, good morning, Nigeria. Um, going to talk today about abnormal head posture. No disclosures. When a patient comes to see you with an abnormal head posture, the first thing you have to work out is what is driving the abnormal head posture? Is it being driven by something visual? or is it being driven by something unrelated to vision? And that will tell us which book we open to, to find out more. If the abnormal head posture is visually driven, I, the doctor, tell the patient, close your eyes and hold your head straight. If with the eyes closed, the patient holds the head straight, then the abnormal head posture is visually driven. If the abnormal head posture is not related to vision, when I say to the patient, close your eyes and hold your head straight, then the abnormal head posture is not improved. Both eyes closed is the same as both eyes open. And the problem is otoneurological. And sometimes it seems to be both uh, visually driven and otoneurologically driven. If it's otoneurologically driven, we owe a lot to uh, people like Agnes Swong and her wonderful textbook. Um, and this is an example of a recent patient who comes in with a head tilt. And when I ask him to close his eyes and straighten his head, of course, uh, his head tilt does not change. And his head tilt is not visually driven. When we are describing head tilts, there are three, three T's. We describe the tilt, the turn, and the tip. The tilt is to the left or to the right, the turn is to the left or to the right, and the tip is up or down. And I measure as accurately as I can, and I try to use a protractor. Um, it's often simpler, uh, to use an electronic protractor from my iPhone to measure these, uh, these important parameters. Usual causes of head tilt are listed here. The commonest cause is a vertical strabismus. Other causes are ocular tilt reaction, childhood nystagmus, either idiopathic infantile nystagmus or the torsional form of fusional maldevelopment nystagmus. Sciencia syndrome can cause a head tilt. Incorrect astigmatism correction can cause a head tilt. Head tilt can uncommonly be caused by restriction in the orbit, by spasmus nutans, and by a rare condition, paroxysmal torticollis. Face turn. Commonest cause of face turn that I see and you will see is probably incompetent horizontal strabismus. 
childhood nystagmus will cause a face turn. Uh, commonly idiopathic infantile nystagmus, fusional male development nystagmus, periodic alternating nystagmus. The horizontal component of Ciencia syndrome will cause a face turn. Incorrect astigmatism correction will cause a face turn. I'll go through a lot of these causes in more detail in a few moments. Uncommon causes of a face turn, horizontal gaze paresis, a hemianopia, an orbital restriction. Tip up, tip down. Commonest cause that I see is incompetent strabismus, the congenital fibrosis syndromes, the alphabet patterns, thyroid eye disease, idiopathic infantile nystagmus with a vertical nun, null, or a vertical gaze paresis. Uncommon causes of a tip are listed here. Um, the pretty rare but uh, difficult to assess paroxysmal tonic up gaze, paroxysmal tonic down gaze, the scar syndromes in uh, third decade of life and Sandifer syndrome. So we have this pretty complicated jigsaw puzzle with all these different types of abnormal head posture, all these different diseases, and we need to sort them out. Today I'll consider a few examples only. A head tilt to the left, a face turn to the left, and tip up and tip down. I'll also look at any of these abnormal head postures as the null for nystagmus. Uh, when it's the null for nystagmus, it needs evaluation for convergence null, convergence null for both near and for distance, as we'll see. Now, this is probably the most important slide of the whole talk. When you see a child or an adult with an abnormal head posture, you have to assess whether it is present or whether it is driven by both eyes closed, both eyes open, and only with both eyes open. So here we have uh, the uh, lady on the left has a head tilt, and when either eye is patched and that she's only using one eye, then there is no head tilt. RF, right eye fixing. With the right eye fixing, she has a head tilt. And with the left eye fixing, she does not have a head tilt. And LF, here we have with the left eye fixing, she has a head tilt. With the right eye fixing, she has no head tilt. And here we have a head tilt to the left that is present with both eyes open and also with either eye fixing. The important little gadget down in the bottom right hand corner, pinhole glasses. These are very important in assessing every person who comes with an abnormal head posture. Because if pinhole fixes the abnormal head posture, then it's a refractive cause. And the commonest refractive cause that I see is uncorrected astigmatism. I'm very grateful to Marc Gobin. Marc Gobin was, uh, um, he's still with us, I believe. He practiced uh, both uh, in the south of Belgium and in the Netherlands. And he was famous or infamous for his, um, uh, for oblique dysfunction and his attitude to hyperopia. But his textbook contains many, uh, many wonderful comments on how to examine patients and many hints. And he was the first person who pointed out to me the importance of monocular and binocular patching to assess the cause of, torticol of torticollis. So, as we saw here, 
as we saw here, how important it is to assess patients with both eyes open and then one eye at a time. He was the first person to bring this to my attention. And this is the cover of his textbook and a relevant page from his textbook. He mostly wrote in Flemish and he wrote very little in English. Um, the South Africans who read Afrikaans can understand his Flemish uh, writings because it's a similar the language is very similar but this um, uh, English translation uh, is a gem so let's talk about head tilt to the left and a few examples for head tilt to the left is only there with both eyes open it's caused by vertical strabismus with either eye fixing, there is no tilt. To find out what's causing the tilt, I tilt the patient's head to the right, and it's usually a right hyper. A common misconception is that head tilt is driven by torsion. That's not true. I think Kushner showed very nicely about 10 years ago that head tilt is driven by vertical strabismus not by torsional strabismus. Head tilt to the left with either eye open. So with both eyes closed, the head is straight. <clears throat> with both eyes open, the head is tilted to the left. So therefore, this head tilt is visually driven. And with either eye patched, the fixing eye drives the head tilt. This is infantile nystagmus with a torsional null. Sometimes we see this clinical phenotype without nystagmus, and there's no good explanation for it. Um, this is a not uncommon clinical presentation, and there are two references there, sort of an old one and a more recent one uh, for surgically fixing these patients. Uh, I find the von Norden approach to be uh, technically fairly simple and uh, not consistently reliable. The Dr. Luders approach I think is more uh, complicated, especially the inferior oblique aspect and more reliable. Now, if we have a head tilt to the left with both eyes closed and both eyes open and driven by left tilt, by left fixation and driven by right fixation, this is the ocular tilt reaction. The head tilt is independent of visual input. There's usually a vertical tropia as well, so-called skew deviation. But Unlike the head tilt in a super oblique palsy, the head tilt in ocular tilt reaction is not therapeutic. It doesn't fix the head tilt. It doesn't fix the diplopia. The head tilt doesn't fix anything. Supine position will fix the vertical diplopia. And we'll see an example of that shortly. The Ocular tilt reaction has been very nicely described over the last few years by Agnes Wong in, these, in this seminal paper and in this uh, publication of an APOS workshop uh, that I would recommend for you. Here's an example of a patient who has a vertical misalignment in the top right part of the slide. You see how she has a right hyper when she's sitting up. And when she tilts her head right back, and I stand up on a chair next to her and take a photo from above, we can see that with her head supine, that her vertical tropia disappears. So this is typical with skew deviation and ocular tilt reaction, how the, the vertical misalignment is otolith driven. It's not driven 
by a neuromuscular abnormality. A simple, um, a simple question to ask the patient, every patient, about vertical diplopia is, when you lie down, do you still see double vision when you look up at the ceiling? And that's a very simple way of diagnosing probable skew deviation as the cause of vertical diplopia. Face turn to left can be caused by strabismus. Here we have a patient with face turned to the left, left eye fixing, no face turn, right eye fixing, no face turn, both eyes fixing, she has a face turn, and the face, and we turn the face to the right to find out what is the cause of the face turn. And here the face turn is caused by uh, left isotropia. So the face turn to the left caused by left isotropia, caused by horizontal strabismus. Face turn to left can be caused by childhood nystagmus. The poor young doctor in the corner of this slide is trying to understand all about childhood nystagmus. When examining abnormal head posture in a child with nystagmus, it's important to uh, use as low an acuity target as possible to bring out the abnormal head posture. I use a slightly supra threshold target that changes every few seconds. Uh, I use the uh, MNS acuity machine that does this very nicely. And this tends to uh, demonstrate a fairly consistent abnormal head posture. As we know, there are two main types of childhood nystagmus, so-called infantile nystagmus. This is the early onset nystagmus seen with symmetric congenital sensory disorders, such as albinism, optic nerve hypoplasia, also called congenital nystagmus, congenital motor nystagmus, congenital sensory nystagmus. And the other main type of childhood nystagmus, fusional maldevelopment nystagmus, FMN, previously called latent manifest latent nystagmus. This is the nystagmus that is seen with strab infantile onset strabismus and or an asymmetric sensory disorder. So we have two different types of nystagmus that can cause a face turn. And there's this seminal paper by Dr. Spielmann, uh, who gave one of the first NAP lectures uh, for APOS. And she points out both the difficulty and the importance of differentiating these two different types of nystagmus uh, as they cause an abnormal head posture. So we'll have a look at an example face turned to the left. With both eyes closed, there's no face turn. With both eyes open, there is a face turn. Either eye fixing, there is a face turn. With uh, a fusional male development nystagmus, we'll talk about that first and have a few examples. Uh, this is the nystagmus associated with infantile strabismus. The patient has a bilateral monocular nystagmus. It's usually horizontal, 25% atorsional. Nystagmus with right fixation is not the same as the nystagmus with left fixation. With right fixation, there is a horizontal nystagmus to the right, plus or minus a torsional nystagmus. With left fixation, there is a horizontal nystagmus to the left, plus or minus a torsional nystagmus. Blocking the horizontal nystagmus 
to improve acuity produces a face turn, blocking the torsion on the stagmus to improve acuity produces a head tilt. And we'll see some examples in a moment. Here is a head tilt to the left driven by left eye fixing. Torsional fusional metal development nystagmus, torsional FMN, results in this fixation in, in torsion of the dominant left eye. The dominant left eye recruits the superior oblique and blocks the torsion on the stagmas of the fixing eye to improve acuity. It looks like preference for fixation in torsion. The same mechanism causes right DVD. Face turn. Both eyes closed, no face turn. Both eyes open, face turn to left. Left fixation drives the face turn to the left. With right fixation, there is no face turn. So here we have left fixation drives a face turn to the left, and it's driven by horizontal FMN. Fixation in a deduction, face turn to the fixing eye, recruits the medial rectus, and this acts as a break and blocks the horizontal nystagmus of the fixing eye to improve acuity. So a patient with FMN will tend to turn the face to the fixing eye. There is a preference for fixation in a deduction. This same mechanism causes the dissociated horizontal deviations. Here we have um, a rather complex situation. Both eyes closed, no abnormal head posture. Both eyes open, head tilt to the left. Left fixation, head tilt to the left. This is probably torsional FMN. There is a torsional nystagmus. We recruit the left superior oblique to act as a break. This break nulls the nystagmus, improves acuity. Left fixation causes this. Both eyes open causes this. So the left eye is the dominant eye. When we force right fixation, this patient has a face turn to the right. This child, this, this um, person, had infantile onset strabismus, and the face turn to the right is driven by horizontal FMN. The right middle rectus is recruited to act as a break, B-R-A-K-E, on the nystagmus, improve acuity. So here we have a, a complex abnormal head posture that is fixation dependent. We go back to um, something simpler, face turned to the left, either eye fixing, face turned to the left. If there is strabismus, it can become more complicated. Now, whenever we have any childhood nystagmus with any abnormal head posture, we will often have a convergence null. So if we have a face turn that is being driven by infantile nystagmus, we will often have a convergence null for near. And if we have a convergence null for near, you should now test to see if there is a convergence null for distance. Simple. Add seven doctors base out with minus one OU, so a total of 14 base out. If this produces a convergence null for distance in the office, the child should wear these glasses in a real life trial for at least a few days. 
if the convergence null for distance is frequently preferred in a real life trial, we can continue with the prism glasses for years, or we can do a BMR to produce the same effect, so-called artificial divergence surgery. How common is a convergence null for distance? This was um, uh, just some results of 88 consecutive eye movement recordings uh, from my practice. And one third of my patients who have uh, mostly idiopathic infantile nystagmus, one third have a convergence null for distance. And the detail with this table suggests that this is probably uh, an underestimate. Also suggests that the PAN um, estimates are also an underestimate. This is an example. Here is a boy who's got a pretty complicated multiplanar null associated with idiopathic infantile nystagmus. He's got a face turned to the left and a tip up. And wow, base out prism with a little bit of minus demonstrates a convergence null for distance. And at least in the office, he prefers this distance convergence null <coughs> to the large face turn and tip up. It's simpler for him to use a conversion cell for distance if it's available. And now he needs to wear these glasses in a real life trial. And if they work well, he can continue with the glasses or have a small BMR. Here is a difficult problem. A patient who has both a face turned to the left and a face turned to the right on different occasions. And there are two main explanations. One of them is periodic, periodic alternating nystagmus, PAN. PAN is a variant of idiopathic infantile nystagmus. Uh, it's maybe 25% of my infantile nystagmus cohort. I have no idea what it would be in Nigeria. Uh, it's very underdiagnosed. Uh, some types are easily diagnosed on the history, on the examination, and some types are difficult to diagnose. A phenotypically similar condition is alternating face turn driven by fusion well development nystagmus. If the vision is fairly equal, then the patient may alternate between right fixation and left fixation. Right fixation will produce a face turn to the right, left fixation, a face turn to the left. And uh, this is the FMN driven alternating face turn. And finally, tip up and tip down. These are pretty rare. Um, with both eyes open, and if present with either eye open, this is a vertical gaze paresis or palsy. This is infantile nystagmus with a vertical null. Or this is one of the pretty rare um, SCAR, spinous cerebellar atrophy syndromes. We have a couple of um, populations in Australia, genetic uh, populations in Australia where these are fairly common. I don't know if they are seen um, in your country. In children, tip up and tip down, um, healthy neonates can be seen with paroxysmal tonic up gaze, paroxysmal tonic down gaze. If it's strabismic, uh, CFEOM can produce a tip up, a thyroid eye disease, 
tip up or tip down. And if it's only present with both eyes open, it's probably an alphabet pattern strabismus, A or V pattern. And that's all I have to tell you today. Uh, Dr. Adio, can are you there? There. I just muted my. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. I can't hear you now. Now you can? Now I can. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that was a very interesting one, though a little bit complicated. Um, we would like to ask some questions. I don't know whether the audience have any questions there. Okay, we have some participants there. Do you have any questions? All right, Florence, you have a question there. Florence, I saw that you raised your hand. If you have something to say, you can do that. But while we are waiting, um, it will be interesting to, because we talked about periodic alternating um, Yes. Right here, sometimes I see like maybe like two or three in a month of uh, periodic alternating nystagmus. But what to do with them, you know, is the issue. So really, maybe you shed more light on what we can do for these patients who have periodic alternating nystagmus. Okay. The uh, periodic alternating nystagmus is a subgroup of idiopathic infantile nystagmus. Um, uh, many of them will be uh, diagnosed on the history. So the parents will tell you or will show you photos where three photos show a face turned to the left and the next 10 photos show a face turned to the right. And um, um, uh, or it'll be um, obvious in your examination, but in children, it's a little different to the acquired PAN in adults. In children, it's the periodicity is often very asymmetric. It may be five minutes to one side and only a minute to the other side. And unless you're watching the child all the time, you will miss it. Or it might be five minutes to one side and then back to primary. And unless you think of it, you will miss it. If you think of it, <laughs> then what I think you should do is do the base out prism test. You put up seven doctors base out in each eye with some minus with minus one. And if that fixes the PAN, then you don't need to look further. Then it's PAN with a convergence null for distance. And the prisms will fix the face turn. The prisms will improve the acuity if the nystagmus is degrading the acuity. Mm -hmm. And the prisms will enlarge the null zone and the child will function better. If the prisms work very well and the child or parent wants the child to be independent of prism, you can do a BMR. Um, I have, when I do the BMR, I've always also BMR done... Is, uh, by media recession? By media recession. By media? Okay. By recession. Um, the... Uh, the world's early large experience on this was from France, Dr. Spielmann. She always did quite large recessions um, and had a low but uh, definite incidence of consecutive exotropia. I have always tended her to do small recessions. If 15 diopters of prism 
uh, fixes, uh, produces a conversion of sulfur distance, I'll only do a bimetal recession of three. Sometimes that turns out not to be enough. And I'll go mm -hmm. back and do a little bit more. Um, and that's how I, that's how I would diagnose and treat PAN, periodic alternating nystagmus. I'm very lucky in that I have a nystagmus laboratory. <laughs> and, and so I have, um, Larry Abel is, um, is in my city and um, he, pre he just um, uh, measures, he does beautiful eye movement recordings. And, uh, mm -hmm. but um, uh, what I've described, what I've described, you don't need eye movement recordings. Um, now, I see there's a question, um, explain the treatment modality for infantile nystagmus with abnormal head posture with a null point. Um, uh, I tend to, uh, is Richard Hurtle known in Africa? Is what? Richard Hurtle. Is he known in Africa? Okay, yes, we know, yes. I was going to ask you that because he does a lot of uh, nystagmus surgery, in, um, disinsertion and reinsertion. I don't know what you think about that. Maybe when you answer this one. Well, um, if, if you, um, he is um, he's famous for a tenotomy resuture operation. Yes. And it's, it's an operation that he doesn't do very often. <laughs> The, co the commonest, the commonest operation that he does um, uh, are, um, are the ones that um, uh, are um, Kestenbaum type operations or Anderson type operations Anderson. or the combination. That um, uh, that's I think they are the number one and two surgeries that he does. The bimedial recession that I refer to so-called mm. artificial divergence surgery, divergence surgery. Mm. Um, and the tenotomy, the tenotomy resuture operation is about 10% of his surgical caseload for nystagmus. So mm. he will do that in a patient with periodic alternating nystagmus who does not have a demonstrated yes. convergence null. Okay. He will do that in a patient with nystagmus whose eye movement recording shows poor foveation time. Unfortunately, you can't demonstrate that in any other way other than by eye movement recordings. Mm -hmm. If an eye movement recording shows poor foveation time, this tells us that the nystagmus itself is compromising the acuity. And if we can, if we can improve the foveation time, we may improve the acuity. So that is, um, that is one indication for doing the tenotomy resuture operation. It's a very uncommon indication and is often successful. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So for the, um, the nystagmus surgery that the patient, this person was asking, Infantile nystagmus with uh, a null point. In so, so how do you how do you treat that? Well, I I Is pretty much treatment? follow I pretty much follow all Richard Hurtle's surgical recipes, okay. um, <laughs> and for horizontal and for vertical, um, and I pretty much follow his um, his recipes. Um, the uh, I'm not sure about torsion. I'm, um, I tend to do the Luda surgical recipe that I mentioned um, in my talk, mm. uh, Greg mm. Luda. Um, but these are, are not common. Um, Can you explain I, that Greg Luda? That Luda. Maybe? The um, for. Uh, I think you need to look at the paper for the, okay. uh, on, on one eye, um, he, disins he uh, disinserts the anterior half of the superior oblique tendon 
and on the other eye, he does a, um, a quite a large recession of the inferior oblique, and that combination um, fixes the face to, fixes the head tilt. Um, I think you need mm -hmm. to you need to look at his paper, and you need to follow his recipe as accurately as you can. Um, yeah, he, um, no one will do many of these surgeries, so you need to, I think, just follow it, follow his recipe as perfectly as you can. Mm -hmm. Now, now the, the question says uh, the, the infantile is have not with abnormal head posture with a null point. What if the the null point is in face uh, um, to the left? How would you say that? Well. If the if a child has um, with nystagmus has a null uh, has a face turned to the left, so, so the they have point. so they have a null in right gaze. First yes. thing I would do is to see if they have a convergence null for distance. Yeah. If they so have a convergence, if they have a convergence null for distance with prisms in the consulting room then I prescribe prism glasses. And I either see them in two or three weeks or ask the parents to send me photos uh, in two or three weeks with a progress note of how they're going. If prism glasses are clearly successful, that is a good first treatment. If prism glasses are clearly unsuccessful, for any reason, including the desire not to wear glasses, then I would do an operation. And again, I follow the, I follow the hurdle recipes. Uh, less than 20 degrees, I would just do two muscles. Um, so for a uh, left face turn, I would um, recess the right lateral and the left medial. And if it's more than a 20 degree face turn, uh, I would do four muscles, um, recess resect on each eye using Richard Hurtle's surgical doses. And, and um, that's what I would do. Um, I see there's another... Um, question. Another question. When do we opt for surgical management in abnormal head posture? Mm. Um, well, um, there's, I think that's two questions. There's two questions there, maybe nystagmus and not nystagmus. Mm. So um, if a patient um, has um, an abnormal head posture that's not due to nystagmus, you um, offer surgery if you understand what's going on and if you are likely to help that patient and if the patient um, if on discussion uh, with the patient when you offer um, uh, your treatment options the patient finds them attractive <laughs> um, uh, and the third question there what should be the approach for general ophthalmologist to be sure he doesn't miss diagnosing any mild abnormal head posture. Um, I don't think in general, a mild abnormal head posture is important. <laughs> so don't worry about, um, uh, about a, a mild abnormal head posture. It's, um, unless I've misunderstood the question. Okay, I think what the person is trying to find out is how do you even know as someone has an abnormal head posture, because what I do to be able to know someone has an abnormal head, because when they, they come in with their head straight, so you tell them to read the visual, the visual activity chart at the appropriate yes. distance, yes. and then you keep reading until you see the smaller letters, and then you start seeing the abnormal head posture. Yes. Know, with, uh, yes, as they keep reading, as they pay attention to. And if they are preverbal, just show them something that is interesting. And you see the abnormal head posture. You know, yes. While they're trying to see exactly what you know. Uh, yes. You know, so you you can't miss it if someone it will make them to miss something. So yes. the additional thing now is to check whether the patient 
whether it's visual driven or whether it is not by um, adding a patch either to one or the other eye you know, and then you see and then another new thing is to tell the patient to lie down and then you also see whether that whatever if you see any um, abnormal head posture or you see a movement of the eye that is abnormal so whether it's still there when the patient is lying flat right? you can take pictures also I'm a great believer of taking pictures you take a lot of pictures to say I'm not a lot of things and uh, yes, so and I, and getting um, getting the parents to take photos, it's very important, yeah. uh, very, very important. important. And yeah. unposed photos when the child is watching television, unposed mm -hmm. photos when they are using their iPad. We have this mm -hmm. um, uh, wonderful international experiment: billions of children using iPads around the world. <laughs> Yeah. And we can um, uh, and we can do all these um, uh, all these wonderful evaluations. Exactly. Okay. Now, if if you have both a squint and an abnormal head posture, like you may have an ET, an esotopia, ET, and then you also have an abnormal head posture. Maybe you have a face down, or you have your head tilt. Which one would you tackle first? And would I have any bear, any, any um, uh, bearing on how much dosage you would do for the Kesson bomb? These are very <laughs> difficult questions, Dr. Adia. Yeah. Very yeah. difficult. <laughs> These, um, if you have too many patients like this, you'll go gray. <laughs> 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 That's my explanation <laughs> for my grayness. <laughs> now, uh, the um, uh, I did my fellowship in Philadelphia, and yeah. one of my chiefs was Dr. Reinick. And do this was one of Dr. Reinick's great interests, mm -hmm. is um, trying to, he produced lots of tables to modify the Kestenbaum operation for different types of associated strabismus. Um, it's um, fortunately, it's not a common problem. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's often difficult. And uh, you often, uh, I will often try and fix them both at the same sitting. And, oh. mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, often successful, sometimes not, sometimes need a second surgery. It's, uh, mm -hmm. um, there is no, uh, there is no magic to this. There is just, uh, um, uh, uh, approach it, um, carefully discuss it with your colleagues, um, discuss it with your fellow and, um, try to produce the most logical operation. Um, if an eye is amblyopic, that's easier because that eye will never be driving um, a face turn or a head tilt. Um, but it's just, uh, it's difficult. There is no easy answer. Uh, so there's no easy answer for anything. So uh, all we can do is do a good examination. Um, you might ask for a second opinion in addition. But the general advice is to make sure that the abnormal head posture is stable first before you do any um, surgical procedure for the patient. Um, what yes. do you think is the minimum yes. or maximum age? Minimum will be best. Which, what do you think is the minimum age before you start doing surgery for abnormal head posture? How long do you want to do? I, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Um, Dr. Hurtle, um, his answer is as soon as the child is walking. Um, and certainly um, I have seen children with um, bad head postures um, who, uh, where it seems to have resulted in late walking. And maybe if they um, had had their head postures fixed earlier, they would have walked earlier and better. Maybe. Um, so Dr. Hurtle, who's, I think, the most experienced person in the world, um, mm. uh, he would say earlier, the earlier, the better. 
Um, mm. That's, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, I don't think I've ever operated on an abnormal head posture for nystagmus in the, in the first year of life, or maybe not even in the second year of life, but certainly in the um, third and fourth year of life, yes. If um, I have a corridor in my office and I will ask the child um, to run to a parent at one end of the corridor, then to run back to me at the other end. Mm -hmm. And if the mm -hmm. child runs with a very bad face turn um, mm -hmm. or a head tilt, then I will operate. I'll recommend surgery. And the parent uh, will see that it's sensible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So that, that, that's a good one. So sometimes, you know, you get worried. The parents uh, really don't know what to say, whether they should wait a little bit until the child is bigger, whether it's going to change. And then sometimes even in the in the consulting room, it doesn't show every time, you know, or it's yeah. bad sometimes. And then it becomes, you know, when you examine more, you, you really see, especially when the child is paying attention, you will see a very bad head posture. So, okay, so like you said, when you see that things manifesting most of the time and affecting the child's uh, quality of life, that should be a good sign to do something for that step. So I think there are some other questions there. Somebody is saying that uh, what else can be done after you have corrected for astigmatism and there's still residual abnormal head posture? And then someone else said, what is the Kestenbaum course? We have like uh, a minute or so. What is the Kestenbaum surgery? And then finally, you know, summarize the management of this patient, especially those okay. who have misplasmus. Okay. okay, well, there's a question, what is the Kestenbaum surgery? There were, okay. uh, in the, I think in the uh, 1950s or 60s, there were um, two papers that came out in the same year, one from Australia mm -hmm. by Anderson and one from New York uh, by Kestenbaum mm -hmm. on um, treatment for um, mostly face turn in um, congenital nystagmus, as they called it then. And both um, uh, the Kestenbaum approach was more aggressive, recess resect on each eye. The Anderson mm -hmm. approach was recess only. So for your uh, example before of a face turn, to the left, the child who prefers right gaze, I would um, recess the right lateral, uh, Anderson would recess the right lateral and the left medial. And mm -hmm. Kestenbaum would recess both of those and resect the right. other two muscles. And I think it's uh, a little bit of um, degree, sort of the, the four muscle will have a bigger effect on a big face turn the two muscles will have a, uh, a big effect on a small to medium face turn. So um, I think it's just a matter of uh, the bigger the face turn, the more surgical dose you want. Um, that's the Kestenbaum. Um, a child who still has residual head posture after correcting for astigmatism, um, mm -hmm. if it's nystagmus, uh, you just, um, uh, if it's a face turn, you know, two muscles or four muscles, as I've just described. Mm. Um, okay. Well, we have a lot of albinos here in Nigeria. Wow. Albinos, yes. And they usually wow. have a lot of nystagmus. So that, wow. that's where it's a big challenge, you know. Wow. So usually we give drops. Azop drops. Azop drops. Um, do, do they work? Yes. Do they ever it, help? It works. Yes. Well, though, though we don't have eye movement recordings, but I have uh, videos of before and after, just plain videos, not because we don't yeah. have eye movement uh, recording and it's Um But but we have um, um, I have pictures of height was moving with very poor probation time, and then I have recordings of after using ASOP, and they're still on ASOP. But you see, you want something that's maybe a little bit more permanent, 
and um, maybe doing this research, research. I mean, um, tenotomy, tenectomy, and researcher. Re researcher might yeah. be very important um, yeah. for them. I've been a little bit wary. I've not done any. I mean, of the, but they are doing well with uh, uh, those drugs. But you see, well, you know, something that is more permanent would have been, you know, quite good. Uh, well, um, uh, I've I have used Azopt in a number of patients, um, and none of them continue to what? use it. None of them continue. Yeah. None of them continue. So, um, so I've um, uh, in my uh, cohort, it doesn't seem to be that effective. Um, okay. If I um, if I had a patient with albinism um, yeah. and if they had a convergence null, I would do a small bimedial recession and tenotomy sure researcher. And okay. if um, there's a little bit of a problem with bimedial recession in albinism, mm -hmm. uh, the, al the albinos that I see all have a positive angle kappa. And if you do a bimedial recession, you may you uh, may um, uh, you may bring this to the parent's attention. Mm -hmm. Even if you do not produce a consecutive exotropia, the parents uh, may blame the surgery for the positive angle kappa that has always been there. Do you have positive angle? It, in in Caucasians, yes, in Caucasians in with al with albinism, we have po they have yes. positive angle kappa. Do you have this in in your cohort too? Very few. But Very few. I've seen it. Thank you. Yes. Well, it and, uh, and in fact, we are one not to do surgery for people like that. Those who have positive angle kappa, it, it doesn't really. If you do surgery for them, it, it doesn't work well. Um, so. Uh, so if you do surgery for the nystagmus, is that what you're saying? For the positive angle kappa. Uh, well, you can't do surgery for that. But okay. uh, patients who have albinism... It's uh, like an ET. They look like XT. E e e e right? Yeah, it's going to be there. Um, like okay. Okay. So um, if you don't have eye movement recordings, if they are straight, and if they have a um, a positive response to prism test, um, mm -hmm. and if they wear prisms, and it mm -hmm. works, then you should consider sure by medial recession. Okay. And if they don't have that, Large I would one. I would think that um, tenotomy researcher is such a low morbidity operation that um, uh, I would be, if I had no no way of measuring the foveation time, I would still be happy to offer it. <laughs> it is such mm -hmm. a low morbidity procedure. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that would be my attitude. <laughs> so you would do all four horizontal muscles? All four horizontal muscles. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, I think uh, I think we've answered most of the questions now. We've talked about the management. Would you like to summarize finally and then we end? The wow. management of AHP. <laughs> management of AHP. You said it, it's It's simple and it's difficult. <laughs> you have to approach it logically. You have to ask the question, um, is the abnormal head posture, is it definitely driven by vision or is it not driven by vision? If it's driven by vision, is it there only with both eyes open, only with left fixation, only with right fixation, or is it there with either eye fixing? You have to answer those mm -hmm. questions before you can understand what's going on and how to help the patient. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the summary. That's and someone has just asked, can you please explain the mechanism of the drops for nystagmus? Um, 
I don't know that anyone un understands the mechanism. Nobody, nobody understands. Uh, no, nobody. and um, it's just like it's side effects and that yeah. people notice that it I, works in some, it doesn't work in some. I have another small subgroup of um, uh, teenagers, adolescents aged uh, 16 to 20, um, whose mm -hmm. vision is not good enough to get a driver's license. <laughs> Here to get a driver's license, they have to be 2040. What is it in Nigeria? Is it similar or? 69, yes, 2040. 2040. And um, I will sometimes use drugs, um, Neurontin, Gabapentin, to get, mm -hmm. um, to, get uh, to improve the vision by a line or two so they can get their driver's license. <laughs> and. Oh, and Neurontin um, sometimes helps. Um, if a child might have PAN, baclofen um, sometimes helps and improves acuity. So these are just in that small subgroup of adolescents. Well, we've had a very stimulating time. We had uh, thank Some you very much. Interesting question. Thank you, Dr. Lionel Kowal. Thank you, Dr. Adio. Thank All you. All the way from Australia, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. It's yeah. a very complex topic. Um, I'm not sure one hour plus will do justice to it. Um, there's still a lot to be read about. There's still a lot to find out. Even the world's um, expert, Dr. Hattie, is still saying he doesn't know everything about uh, nystagmus and abnormal head posture, but it's something that we have to tackle as pediatric ophthalmologists and as autopsies. So you're all very welcome to have um, been with us for the last one hour. I'm, I hope you were not confused. You were able to understand something, um, some new information also about how to examine this um, patient was given. Thank you Thank very much. You. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>